Hello and welcome to the Day Connection here on Friday, August 4th at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're going to read our daily lectionary text for today and talk about it and see if there's anything that we can kind of uh, discern from the text and see how God might be using it in our lives. Let me open us in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for a chance for Natalie and I to get together and read your word and uh, think about it and pray about it and talk about it and um, hopefully uh, be changed, uh, challenged, and comforted by it. Uh, so bless the reading of your word today, Lord. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, today, we uh, being on Friday, we're reading a little bit of reading some psalms that might be different for some of us, uh, but it's always good to hear a broader spectrum of the things that God says in his word. So today we are starting with Psalm 88. O Lord, God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence, let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help, like those forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a thing of horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call on you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your saving help in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry out to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast me off? Why do you hide your face from me? Wretched and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am desperate. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dread assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. From all sides they close in on me. You have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness. In Psalm 148, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who were close to him. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was thirty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years. At Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah thirty-three years. 
The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here. Even the blind and the lame will turn you back, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. David had said on that day, Whoever would strike down the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, those whom David hates. Therefore it is said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around him from the millow inward. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David along with cedar trees and carpenters and masons who built David a house. David then perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. And Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. After Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Ap uh, Apollonia, they came to Thess Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days argued with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and with the help of some ruffians in the marketplaces, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. While they were searching for Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly, they attacked Jason's house. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some believers before the city authorities, shouting, these people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has entertained them as guests. They are all acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king named Jesus. The people and the city officials were disturbed when they heard this, and after they had taken bail from Jason and the others, they let them go. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea, and when they arrived, they went to the Genesis. Jewish synagogue. These Jews were more receptive than those in Thessalonica, for they welcomed the message very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, including not a few Greek women and men of high standing. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea as well, they came there too to stir up and incite the crowds. Then the believers immediately sent Paul away to the coast, but Silas and Timothy remained behind. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions to have Silas and Timothy join him as soon as possible, they left him. Our gospel reading today comes from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, which that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, 
But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And back to our Psalms, Psalm 6. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord, for I am languishing. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul also is struck with terror, while you, O oh Lord, how long? Turn, O oh Lord, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. And Sheol, who can give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard and heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. And our final psalm today, Psalm 20. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses. But our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Oh, is there any place that you want to start today? I, I don't know. Um... Not that you have no. to. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly where I would want to start. Kind of the the whole thing is um, as we're reading them and um, in the Acts and the in the the Mark passage. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting that um, so many times when Jesus is at work, we don't understand it. And, um, you know, that in the Acts, that statement that, you know, turning the world upside down and um, the way that we think things should be done is completely opposite and contrary to, to the work that is being done. And sometimes that that is difficult. Right. So I'm not sure well, where you want to yeah, focus well, that down. That's, that's great. just kind of the overwhelming. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's actually a good place to start because what do we have in both of these instances? We have... Paul and Silas going to Greek cities, mm -hmm. and it's not that he doesn't talk to the Jews there in the synagogues, he does, and some mm -hmm. believe, so you know, uh, many even believe, but not all of them. And so what we find happening is that Greeks are starting to believe, and then it even has that line in there, the Acts passage, that well, the Jews got jealous and then wanted to go and stir things up and create all these problems. And when in the world are the Jews, you know, claiming, oh, well, he's he's proclaiming a different king? Well, you know, the Jews don't worship Caesar either. The Jews right. don't worship Caesar as God, or you know, as they believe the God is the king of the universe, not see anyway. So it's kind of ironic that they are trying to stir up this uh, animosity towards Jesus by claiming that Paul and Silas are proclaiming a different king other than Caesar. It's like the irony. Right. You don't irony. even acknowledge him yourself, but yet you have a problem with... Right. Right. 
right. somebody else. <laughs> right. Not acknowledging him. Right. Um, Caesar, and, him Caesar. Not him right, Jesus. right, exactly. Him Caesar. Um, and so then the Mark passage, why in the world does Jesus even go to the region of Tyre where mm-hmm. he is going to find some Jews, but obviously a lot of people who are not Jewish. Gentiles even. It says, you know, it has to make it abundantly clear. They're in the region of Tyre. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. And so it's just like, okay, they're in Tyre. They're not even in Israel. They, She's a woman. She is a Gentile. She is a Syrophoenician. I think Mark's going, um, she doesn't fit. She is not the right person. She is not the right person. She's not. And then the, the interaction, though, that she has with Jesus is a little interesting as well because Jesus knows, and everybody knows, she's not the right person. And right. even his initial response emphasizes that fact. Really, right. dogs don't uh, get food from the children's table? Like, or, or, I mean, you know, yeah, like, you know, feed. I'm like, really, Jesus? Right. That's just a little hard because... You know, the Jews did regularly call non-Jewish people dogs. They did not even acknowledge sometimes even a humanity, a basic humanity there. And so it seems kind of weird that Jesus seems to even be kind of using a little bit of a slur Mm -hmm. against this Syrophoenician Gentile woman from Tyre. Um, And so we know that, you know, it makes us uncomfortable. It right. makes me. It makes, I don't. I don't. It, this is a passage I don't always know what to do it with. Ma- it makes me uncomfortable. Uh, right. Jesus' response, but then the woman, um, yeah. But even the dogs get crumbs from the table, and right. Jesus does heal. And then what's weird about it is then he doesn't go back even towards. Um, he goes to the Decapolis, which is a mixed region. You know, mm-hmm. there are Jews and Gentiles and Greeks and Romans and all these people kind of living in the same kind of place. And he interacts again with a deaf man, deaf and mute man, and, and heals him. And so I think, I think that's kind of the whole point, right. is Jesus is actually turning the world upside down. Right. The claims that these instigators in uh, Berea made... And it's true. Right, he is. Jesus is turning the world upside down, and his followers are going to do things that are very contrary to conventions and contrary to their perceived culture and contrary to all these things, and they will turn the world upside down. What do we do with that? Well, that's that's the whole point, is that the things that the world values mm-hmm. are not the things that Jesus valued. Right. And when you look at people... We are all living in the world. And so that is so far outside of our realm. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. And of course, we know eternity. We know we know all of that. But these people are living, and maybe they hadn't even heard about who he was. You know, I mean, they're, they're talking, they're sharing, they're preaching. So people are coming to believe, but they didn't live in that same reality that we live in with that knowledge yeah, for right, some of them. Right. Um, And so to change everything that they know about the world and the way that politics and the way that world, the world works, what are you doing? What are you doing? And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, he's, he is turning it upside down. He's turning it upside down. And so I guess kind of the implications, you know, uh, do we, uh, in our Western, uh, culturally acclimatized churches that, don't always look very different from the world. You know, are we are we doing it right? Are we uh, are we willing to have our own worlds turned upside down in order to follow Jesus, uh, or do we just kind of like things nice and ordered? Um, you know, let's let's jump back to that Second Samuel passage, and and if you've been keeping up with your daily lectionary reading, uh, you know that. Last week we talked about the death of Saul and Jonathan, and then we've been talking about the political complications of Saul's son Ishbaal being promoted by some as king, and then David being promoted as king, and then Abner, who was loyal to Saul, being accused of stuff, and then transferring his allegiance to David. All of that complicated stuff, which just kind of makes me think, oh, we think we have it bad today with politics being rough and tumble. Well, back then, you know, the rough and tumble was, you know, people getting shanked in the shower, 
heart, basically. It, and stone. <laughs> and yeah. stone. And, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, so really no different, right, today? You know, Some parts of the world, but not, some, where, not where we live. Praise the Lord, not yet here, right? right. I don't know. Is it ever going to get to that point? I hope not. Pray to right. God not. But the complications right. of, uh, of power players on earth, um, even biblical power players, is, is complicated and messy and gross right. sometimes. And I, I, you know, read the first couple chapters of Second Samuel and you're going like, dude, that, that's nasty. Nobody wants to be a part of that. But in chapter five, David is finally uh, anointed king over all of Israel. And so that had been something that Samuel had anointed David much earlier, even while Saul was still king, David had been anointed, anointed king. And now finally, the people are kind of catching up to what God had already done. Um, and so I wonder if that's true for a lot of us. God is always the one that's going before us. God is always the one that is um, putting his plan into place and accomplishing his purposes. And it doesn't always play out in the timing that we would expect, but in the timing that's good. Um, but what's interesting even about uh, Saul, uh, about David being anointed king, is he then has to go and conquer Jerusalem. All these insults going on. Uh, but then David being recognized and enthroned as, as king over all of Israel and a house built for David and then David perceiving that uh, finally God's purposes are being implemented. And so, you know, uh, one could probably say even back in that time, if you had been a loyal follower of Saul, that your world is being turned upside down when David is installed um, as king. Um, and how often does God do that? And are we being obedient to what God's calling us to do? Right. Um, and so I found then, uh, I know we don't talk a ton about the Psalms, uh, right. but sometimes I think they really just fit perfectly what's been going on. Where, where Psalm 88, uh, the first one that we read, that of um, this, uh, this Psalm, uh, seems to be one where it doesn't uh, it doesn't have a pleasant resolution. Right. You know, oftentimes psalms will follow a, a pattern of, of acknowledging God who He is and then crying out to Him and, and here's problems, but then here's a restoration. Psalm eighty eight doesn't really seem to do that. They cry out to God, but sense an absence of Him. Right. And, and how difficult that can be. And, and maybe for some of these people, well, maybe for us, you know, I don't know how many times do we feel that God is sometimes silent, uh, even when we try to do those things that God's calling us to do. Do we feel as if God is not present with us? Well, please know that that sense is common to humanity. Right. Uh, people who love God, people who love Jesus, um, in God's uh, providence and wisdom and in his secret will that we don't always understand, right. um, that happens. And to even acknowledge that or even to complain about it or to question it, it's in scripture. It's in, right. it's in our holy words. This is a psalm that I, it's okay for us to sing. Um, and then the contrast between Psalm 88 and 148. Right, to flip completely on its end, and you go from despair and crying out and darkness to praise right. in all circumstances from all of creation. Right. Um, that is something from the Psalms that um, I think sometimes for me, when I read the Psalms, it's kind of a comfort because no matter where I'm at, um, like you said, I think sometimes we go, well, I shouldn't be feeling this way or I shouldn't, um, you know, you do question or you do doubt or you feel like you're far from uh, God for whatever reason. Um, I think read Psalms because this gives us, we are not the only people who have lived that. We are not the only people who have felt those emotions. And you can go through Psalms and there is every emotion from fear and anger and despair to praise and rest and encouragement. And those are all emotions that we feel 
but they are all in Scripture, and right. God is bigger than all of that. And even when we do question and we do despair, He is there. And right. Right. and in that despair of Psalm 88, through God, through Christ, we can be turned to Psalm 148 right. of complete and absolute praise of all creation right. to a worthy God. So, right. mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't feel as if we need Psalm 88, and but when it's there, when, I mean, when we need it, it is it's there. there. Right. right. Um, and then even the final two Psalms that we read, Psalm 6, again, it, it is a Psalm of David, uh, and there is a sense most likely, you know, we all know that David lived a very challenging life, mm -hmm. um, especially even after having been anointed king. You know, right. he was he was anointed king um, and spent so many years uh, in service to Saul uh, and the battles and the challenges and all of these things uh, that we can imagine uh, David praying Psalm 6 pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think the final one, Psalm 20, that we read probably could have been sung or recited uh, with uh, David's actual inauguration as king in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a, seems to be, anyway to me, a psalm of, uh, uh, of intercession for the leadership that the Lord has provided. It's the right. people acknowledging that there is a king. And God bless this king. Let his right. desires be fulfilled. Let his plans and his purposes uh, bring victory. Uh, uh, the Lord fulfill his petitions. All of these things. And so I wonder: Do we, um, you know, do we pray for our leaders in that same regard? Um, not just our political leaders, but our our church leaders, or um, you know. Sounds almost a little self-serving, right there. <laughs> but you know, but but yeah. But are we praying for people that are in authority over us that God would be um, establishing the uh, the desires of their heart? Let their hearts be dedicated to Jesus, obviously. Right. But then let the plans be fulfilled. Right. Mm. There's a lot going on in there. There's a lot going on in there. Even with David, um, it was a timing issue. You know, everything had to be set. And, and in David, in regard to what we talked about in the, the Mark and the Acts, David obviously is the right person. He was anointed by God. But, you know, initially, even David, you know, are you sure you don't have another son somewhere? Right. And um, so even in that, just trusting in God's will, mm -hmm. even when it doesn't look right. the way that the world, or even we, think that it should look. Um, right. And then, like you said, praying that they be lifted up and that, um, that, that God's will can be fulfilled in them. That's, mm. yeah. right, that's good. All right. I'm going to close this in I'd be happy to. All right, awesome. Gracious Lord, thank you for your words to us today. Thank you for your steadfast love and that you are with us in the moments of despair, in the moments of praise, that you are ever present and that you are bigger than all of those emotions that we may feel and that um, you are a God that we serve that is worthy of all praise in difficulties and, and in good. Um, I pray that as we live in this world and things don't always look the way they should or we don't understand our role in the world and, and as we go out and try to shine your light that we recognize that it may not be the popular um, or the easy road to walk but that we remain obedient and that we trust that you do have a plan and that you do have your own timing that, that we may not see, but that it is there and that uh, your promises are fulfilled and that um, you work for the good of all of us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. I look forward to, uh, if you have any questions or comments or concerns or prayer requests, uh, call up to the church and we'd be happy to talk with you and listen with you and pray with you. Uh, but look forward to the next time we can spend together. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.